All right, so we've been going through the attributes of God, and uh, the, this, I think this is like the third, seriously, the third or fourth week that we've been covering the incommunicable attributes of God. Uh, someone, again, what does it mean? What does incommunicable mean? Not shared. Not shared. Unique. They're unique and not shared. Communicable will be things that are shared, like a disease. Communicable diseases. That sounds bad, but that's, that's, that's the only way we use the word communicable. <laughs> Isn't that the only way we use communicable now? Like, it's like in theology and in like immuno diseases, right? So communicable, incommunicable. Um, we've been going through the unique ones. And here's the crazy thing is the list of communicable is much lo- longer and we haven't even hit those yet. So I have no idea what that's doing for us time-wise. We're still incommunicable. Uh, again, this is our, this is our um, Baptist uh, catechism. Um, the old school Baptist catechism. And so uh, I encourage you to kind of, if you don't have a copy of that, to get a copy of that, you can look online. You can go to Founders website has it. Um, I think it's on like Reformed Readers, various, on various places online. Monergism probably even has one. Um, go, go online and look for Baptist catechism. You can also look for Keech's catechism. Um, it was popularized by Benjamin Keech. Uh, it's also what Spurgeon used at their church as part of their uh, discipleship program was this catechism. But the, this is how that you walk through it. It's a question-answer format. Well, this is question seven in the catechism. What is God? God is spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. And we'd say that's, these are kind of the incommunicable attributes there in the beginning inside the, the green brackets. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And so in the red is the communicable attributes. Obviously, this is a minimalistic kind of statement, but I think it's helpful for us. Um, the last one that's on here today, unchangeable, is actually the one we're starting with today. Um, that God is unchanging. He's immutable. Uh, what, is, what do you think that means? This is an easy one. It's like a softball question. He's unchanging. He's immutable. He's not changing. Like This is, like, this is a softball. And you guys are, you guys are, are a little... A little we just went out waking up. You need that coffee. Um, uh, God does not change in his character or nature. Uh, unlike God's changing creation, we say that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, so why would that be of an encouragement to us? Why would, why would that be something that we should know about who God is? We can trust his promises, right? So if God is changing, then his promises are unsure, right? They're on shaky ground. Um, just like our promises, like we have the best intentions, but we don't always follow through with our promises. Why? It's not because we necessarily, and usually it's not because we intended to lie. It's because situations change and we change and therefore the basis on which the promises were made change. We are changeable, mutable creatures. And so our promises are just as shaky as we are. Well, God's not like us. This is why it's an incommunicable attribute. He is unique in this way and that he is unchanging. He's immutable. Um, and so his promises, his word never changes. It's always reliable. It's always resting on his character nature and his character is unchanging. And so that's one of the huge aspects of understanding that God is immutable, unchanging. Um, it's the basis for his commitment to his people. It's the basis for his covenant with his people. Uh, and so uh, g- give me an imagery in scripture that you can think of that scripture talks about that communicates to us this idea that God is unchangeable. A way that maybe God has talked about. What's imagery that you would think about in scripture that communicates this truth? I can't say anything, but he says he can't let anybody in heaven except he's pure. Okay. Okay, so his na- his his holiness is in that nature. Yeah, that's that's true. He, re- he always referred to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so he's pointing back to history. Yeah, kind of pointing to redemptive history. That's true too. Just thinking of James, I can't quote the verse. I think it's James one that talks about there's no shifting or, or changing or shadows or light. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of refers to him as the father of lights and said there's no shadow of turning with him. Um, we sing that in, what's that hymn that says that? Great, Great is thy faithfulness. And you see, why? Right? Great is thy faithfulness, why? Because he doesn't change. How can we trust that God is faithful? It's not, because here's the thing, pe- human beings pledge faithfulness to things all the time, and then we're not. 
And so just saying, well, he's faithful doesn't mean a whole lot unless you can point to the fact that he's unchanging his nature. He, there is no shadow of turning with him. There's nothing changes with him. Um, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, imagery I'm thinking of also is how many times in Scripture do we see that God is referred to as a rock? I mean, a rock is an unchanging thing, right? I mean, you go back to a rock, and it's still a rock. And, and in fact, only, I mean, even in creation, even in our created order, um, where rocks are not immutable, they're still pretty close to immutable, right? I mean, no rock is truly immutable because you can go up and you can chisel it, chisel it out and, and it can erode over time. But it erodes over millions of years or thousands of years. It doesn't erode. I know someone's like, <gasps> millions of years. It erodes over time. <laughs> chill out, chill out. It's okay. <laughs> chill out. Um, it erodes over a long period of time. That's what I'm saying. It erodes over a long period of time. And so, um, but, but we can point to, generally speaking, a rock is a, is a good measure for us of something that doesn't change, right? Uh, there's reasons why um, you uh, look through certain, certain points of our topographical uh, history of the United States, and they go up against mountains, and they're like, ah, it's best for us just to go around this thing. Uh, they, there's times where they try to tunnel through, but usually only in certain places where the rock was like very brittle, and they could do that. Otherwise, they're like, this is not worth our time. We're going around because the rock doesn't change. And so think about that when you're reading through Scripture and you, and you read through Psalm 62 and you, re- and you hear that God is a rock. That is, that's what's being communicated, is that God is unchanging. He's immutable. Um, and so uh, is there any problems? Is, this, is there a problem passage or, or, or something, some idea that you would think about when you hear the word that God is unchanging that might, you might come to your mind that you go, wait, does God change? Is there a problem issue? Yeah. Sometimes in the scripture where people plead with God, you know, not to do something, and he relents. That, yeah. And so it, it's like he's changing his mind, but he's not. Like, you know, right. I can see some people use situations like that to Yeah. Right. So, um, I mean, that's the big kind of problem issue is that, that, but I mean, even on smaller issues, you can think of like, when people go, oh, well, I prayed, and then God heard my prayer, and the situation changed. And you go, well, did God change, or did the situation change? And that's really the question that it's, that's kind of the answer to both, both issues, with the small thing of prayer and the big thing of this issue of, did God really repent of, of his decision? Uh, I, you know, uh, I repent that I even made you kind of language. Um, did God really repent, as in like, He's really regretting a decision? Or is this all about our, situa- our relationship in, in kind of a situational case with who God is and how, and how God, God works? And so... Sometimes the change Yeah. Yeah, it's Hezekiah, right? So it was, it had to be God's plan, because it wasn't like, right. Hezekiah asked for it, and God said, oh, okay, well, we'll let you, right. you know what I mean, it was his plan from the beginning. Correct, and, that, and you're exactly right, that's, that's how it works, is, so from our perspective, it seems like God goes, oh, I'm giving you more time. Or it seems like, well, I'm praying for this person's salvation, and they weren't saved, and now they've come to salvation, so God answered that prayer. And, that's, and it, it's true, God truly answered that prayer, but it's not as if God was sitting back going, oh, I hadn't thought about saving this person before. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm glad you brought this up. Okay, now I'll change my mind and do something different. It, it's more about our understanding of, of how God is working. Um, if things were to go on as they were, it would appear as if nothing would change. Does, does that make sense? Like if, if God were not to intervene, it would appear as if nothing was changing and it would go on this way. But, be, but God also ordains the prayers of his people, right? And so that God, God uses the prayers of us, his people, to affect what is, what is done. Not that it changes his mind, but that the situation is, uh, he, that he utilizes us as part of his plan of carrying out what he wants to do. And so that's a, that's a tr- we're getting into some like really tricky uh, deep theological issues here, but it's, I think it's an important thing to, to bring up. There's also a, a uh, aspect of it that God is revealing himself in language that we can understand. And, and so our language and understanding is limited and not him. So when he says that he's repenting of something, 
Right. Expressing it in a way right. that we can understand. Right. And, and usually it's the, it, like the King James is the one, is the, the big offender in the repent language, right? And so I'm thinking of Numbers 23 and 1 Samuel 15. Um, that, let's see. I'm sorry, th those are the ones that would deny that God repents, right? Those are passages that say that God does not repent. He's not like a man that he has to repent. But then you have passages like Genesis 6 or Exodus 32 or Judges 2 or 1 Samuel 15 or Jonah 3 where it seems as if God is changing his mind on something. And that's where you have this discussion of repenting. And I think later translations, the ESV, the CSB, other ones will have changed that to relent which I think is a better understanding of what's happening there. It's not that God's repenting, because in our understanding, we have a, a, an understanding of repentance as in, I've done something wrong, and, I'm a, I, and I am changing my mind and changing my actions to reflect that I was wrong about something, and now I'm making it right. And that is not what we, we want to be saying about any of those sort of, sorts of things, especially when we have clear denials that God does such a thing in Scripture. And so relent makes a lot more sense. Jeremiah 17.10. Okay. God defined him. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind and give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. That passage? Yeah, that's great. That's great. He's doing that with every one of us. That's true. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Okay, so any other questions on God being immutable or unchanging? Um, and so, uh, does this apply to uh, all members of the Trinity? I know we haven't gotten to the Trinity yet. We're coming up on that and later on. What? Okay. Is there a passage that you could point to that would say it's true of the... Hebrews 13, 8? It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay. Again, another passage I think that clearly points to the divinity of Christ, right? Uh, no, no mere man would be said to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, uh, yeah, so. So we're not talking physical change. Um, then he became man. Yeah, so, yeah. The way that that's described, I'm, so, I'm trying to, sorry, like I'm not avoiding the question. We'll get to that when we get to the Trinity. And so I don't want to give too much away. Um, but the incarnation is not a change as much as it is a putting on. Okay. If that makes sense. And so that would be the, um, so if you go, oh, well, well he changed. No, it's, it's, he put on flesh and dwelt among us. Um, not that he changed forms. That would actually be a, a form of modalism, which is heresy, Patrick. In case you've seen that. We'll, we'll make sure we show that video in here when, when, it's, when it's time to, to get to that. So essentially, so essentially there's there no change in the deed. Yeah, and, and you do get some, like, there are some, some questions about knowledge, like what is it that Christ knows? Because the way that he will talk about things, he'll say, well, no man knows the hour, and then he'll kind of go, like, except for the Father, and whoever he reveals it to, and then he kind of adds in, like, well, I know. Uh, and then you have like kind of hints of things that he, he's knowing things all, you know, all along, right? When he goes up to a woman and is able to, to kind of tell her her sins. Or he knows the heart. I mean, so you, you see things that, so sometimes people say, oh, well, he didn't, they'll kind of use those, his kind of incarnation as a way to kind of pull down his divinity. And that's not, really, that's not how it's talked about. But we'll, we'll, talk, we'll go through some of that when we get into the Trinity. Yeah. And so, um, I, here's the thing that I think we want to rest on this is, um, what I always want to show when we're talking about the incommunicable attributes, these unique attributes is, they belong to God, um, and they belong to God in a way that He still relates to us. We don't share these attributes like, the, like we would with the, with the communicable ones, but there is a sense in which um, all of these ones that are His uniquely benefit us in some way. They, they, they provide some sort of um, benefit to us in relationship to Him. What would be the benefit to us of God, unchanging, of God being immutable? We've already hit on that some, but... Like, I, to me, to reveal to us in His Word is unchanging, so even though society norms and all those things change, His Word is the same as He revealed it to us, so that same God... Yeah. Right. We're not having to constantly reinvent 
who God is and what God, you know, like, but that was what, what God was like back then. Now we understand things more, which is, which if you think about it, is always the way that kind of skeptics and um, opponents of of scripture and Christianity want to, to tackle it is, uh, especially it's kind of like the, the ex-evangelical mantra, right, is, well, you just don't understand, like, like our situation's different now. You don't understand God. That's, you're understanding a different kind of God. We, we have to be more inclusive. We have to be more whatever. And God's word doesn't change. Well, why, how can we say that God's word doesn't change? Because God doesn't change. Um, if God was changing, then his word would be changing. Right? If, God was, if God was mutable, then we could go through this and go, well, of course this is, this is mutable. Of course this, this book is changing. This is just a book. And if God's changing, then the words change. I mean, um, we see a constant attempt to redefine words in our society, right? And so, um, like, every word is up for grabs now. Uh, I'd encourage you to find some dictionaries, like some print dictionaries, and hold on to them. Because... Online dictionaries will, like, they're already changing, by the way, in case you haven't noticed that. They can edit them at will. And so I would encourage you to find some old dictionaries and hold on to them because the way words are being used becomes weapons because language is mutable in this way. It's not really, but it's, it becomes mutable. Um, and so um, things that have always been so are now not so because of changing words. And so when we point to, to word, the word in here, we're pointing back to the God who spoke the word. And the God who spoke the word is unchanging, and so his word is unchanging. That's, that's why we spend so much time going through the word, right? I mean, why is it that we will, we say kind of our, you know, if you were to describe worship at Redeemer to someone outside Redeemer, we'd say, well, worship is, we preach the word, we sing the word, we pray the word, we read the word. And someone goes, hey, eat the word? That was, was a Morgan yesterday. We eat the word? And then like, Lord's Supper, we do. And so everything is revolving around the word. Well, why do we spend so much time going through the word? Why do we spend time going through verse by verse through books of scriptures? Because we believe that God's word is true, every word of it. And if we believe that's true, um, what's the basis for us believing that it's true? It's that God is true, that God is unchanging. And so therefore we can trust his word and we don't have to go, go to the times of this is 2021 so we can't, like, you know, we can't do that anymore. We have to do like, you know, now we have to do a series on you know, whatever movie is out. But we don't have to do that because his word is unchanging and it's always true because he's unchanging. And then the way he changes us is by... And the way, correct. Well, that's the good way of changing us, right? Um, we change in bad ways on our own. He's changing us in good ways through his word. That's exactly right. And through his spirit. Okay, last one for the um, incommunicable attributes is God is great. God is good. I guess you could thank him for this food. But it doesn't even rhyme. It's like, thank you for this food. But that's, that's a whole, or are we saying good, good wrong? Um, God is great. What do we mean by this? Like, we can describe lots of things as good. And we describe lots of things as great. And, and is there a difference between being good and being great? What is it? Well, we, we think of good and great in the way that we use it in our common language as, oh, well, this movie was good. That movie was great. Right? So it's like a stage of degrees, right? Something's good, something's great, and then something is like spectacular, right? We, we think about it in degrees. That's, is that how we're being, it's being used here? No. Yeah, so good would have to be like a character, like a, a, a moral character quality, right? What does great have to refer to? Power? Right? That's true. Like you said before, you're always kind of looking in that lens of eternal infinite. So he's infinitely good, he's infinitely great. Right. Where is we're talking about who we are? Right. So we can talk about great really in two different ways. We can talk about it in great as in this kind of like almighty, powerful kind of thing. But we kind of hit on that already with omnipotence and being almighty. Greatness here is more of kind of an all-encompassing quality that takes all these into account and is like God is above and beyond anything else. It's a way of saying he's other. He is infinitely other in a positive way. 
right? God is great. Um, it's described here, I think Chris Morgan does a good job with, God is of the utmost significance and beyond comparison. So when we say something that, that um, this is, this, if you think about it a little bit, that's why I put good with it, because oftentimes in Scripture, this is what good is getting at also when it's describing kind of a moral character. So say, like, oh, he's good, and Jesus says, well, no one's good but God. Well, what does that mean? That no one is good at all? Oh, well, I mean, Romans says there's no one good, there's no one righteous, no, not one. So in that sense, there's no one morally upright on their own. That's true, and God alone is morally upright. He's all, he alone is holy. He alone is good. Is anyone great? Well, you're like, oh, my, Michael Jordan's great at basketball. Compared to each other, we can be better. But we can't be great in the way that God is great. And that's what this is really about, is that he's the only one in this entire category. He is completely other than anything else. So is it wrong for us to describe things as good or great? No, it's not wrong with that, because we're basically using it, the same word to describe something completely different. We're just comparing things among creation. That's fine. What, what, when we talk about God, though, and we say, he's good, we say he's good or we say he's great, is we're saying he is beyond comparison to anything of us. He, he's beyond that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the God's greatness. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, think about throughout the old, the entirety of the Old Testament, the the comparison of God is that He is unlike all the idols, right? I mean, you come back and you see over and over again that um, some some nation is worshiping some false god, and the comparison is always that God is not like that God. Like our God is is actually alive, right? So the you know, you'll see what's the difference between, with, between God and idols is the idols are carved images. They're made by human hands and they have hands but can't touch things. They have feet but they can't walk. They have mouths but they can't speak. They have ears but they can't hear. And so God's constantly mocking these things, even, even at some points causing um, idols to fall down on their face before him, right? And so you have this picture of the, uh, in every nation, False gods are compared against God. God's the only one who's true. God's the only one that's right. He's other than that. Um, he can't be touched with human hands. He can't be seen with eyes. He's other. Um, and whenever human beings try to make those things, God embarrasses them. Um, I, I think the epitome of the embarrassment is um, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. That's the, that's the epitome of it, where now you have the prophet of God just mocking Baal and his prophets, right? I and mean, he won't answer, and he says, oh, he's, is, your, is your God in the bathroom? Is that where he's at? He's, he's out, he's, he's otherwise indisposed, that's why he can't show up. And so she starts mocking the fact that he's, your God is more human-like, and he's not even here. Our God, let's stack all the deck against him, let's put the, let's put the, sick the wood, and let's wet the wood so that it's unlightable, and then let's see if God will, will light this thing on fire. And he does. Um, over and over again, you see the, this kind of comparison of how God is not like those false gods. Well, then you start seeing the fact that whenever we um, try to lift ourselves up, God goes, who do you think you are? Uh, you think of um, Nebuchadnezzar. You think of, uh, I mean, that's, I mean, honestly, I think that's probably the best example in the Old Testament, right? So here's a, here's a guy who um, tries to, um, draw out worship of himself and God's like you you don't understand what you're doing and here's how you don't understand what you're doing I'm, I'm, you, you are an unthinking animal and I'm going to make you into an unthinking animal and he turns him into a beast remember he roams the, the beast uh, run, runs the field and then eventually uh, God brings him back bring, and I look, brings him back to his senses his senses return to him he kind of changes him back into like what actually looks like a human, and Nebuchadnezzar's response is, yeah, my bad. <laughs> like, my bad, I, I did not understand what I was saying and doing. You alone are God. Um, all the inhabitants of the earth are nothing compared to you. Right, this is, what is the realization he makes is, you are completely other. You alone are great, you alone are good. I misunderstood. 
I thought I was great because I was king, but I realize now all the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. They're, they're like nothing to you. And you are king over everything. And I think that, that realization is, is a great, I mean, it's a great like, response of worship when he realizes I'm not God, you are. I think this all falls into the idea of that God, is, God alone is great. This is what it means to be other. Um, how many times do we see in Scripture God's greatness being praised? Right? Psalm 135, For I know the Lord is great. Our Lord is greater than all the gods. The Lord does whatever He pleases in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the depths. That's Psalm 135. That's a very similar statement to what Nebuchadnezzar says in Daniel 7. The Lord, the God of heavens, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps His gracious covenant with those who love Him and keep His commands. Nehemiah 1, 5. Lord, there is none, there's no one like you. You are great. Your name is great in power. Who should not fear you, king of, of the nations? It is what you deserve, for among all the wise people of the nations and among all their kingdoms, there is no one like you. It's Jeremiah 10, 6 and 7. That's what it means for God to be great. There is no one like him. He's beyond comparison. Psalm 145, the Lord is great and highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation will declare your works to the next and will, and will proclaim your mighty acts. I will speak of your splendor and glorious majesty and your wondrous works. They will proclaim the power of your awe-inspiring acts and I will declare your greatness. And you see how all these things are kind of wrapped up in the greatness of God. And so I think when we say, what is the greatness of God? It really is the, the attribute that defines what it means to be incommunicable for God to be unique, and how it kind of brings in and highlights all these other ones kind of wrapped into one. That's the greatness of God. And God's greatness leads us to worship Him. Any questions on that? We're all on the same page. God is great? Okay. Just think about that. It might give you pause the next time you describe something else as being great. It might give you pause. I don't think it's wrong to do that, by the way. I don't be like, oh, that movie's great. Oh, I love th that food. That, uh, that steak was great. I don't think it's wrong, but it might give you a pause to start and thinking like, God alone's great. Um, I've thought about that a lot when because I, I used to say the word awesome all the time. Oh, that's awesome. And I'm like, I don't really, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, he said that word awesome too. Yeah. I, I said like I and I still do, but I I catch myself now. Um, I don't think it's wrong to say it, so I'm not I'm not encouraging anyone to not say it. But it does cause me to stop and think, is it really awesome? Like, what's awesome? And maybe that's a good thing, like, that I'm stopping and thinking, like, okay, no, God alone is awesome. He's the only one that's worthy of awe. Um, and so, uh, by the way, also in that one, you understand when we sing how sweet and awful is the place, that that's what's awful. I was talking about that, not, like, how terrible something. How is that place sweet and terrible? Like, <laughs> yeah, no, sweet and full of awe is the place with Christ within the, yeah, which is a great song. Um, yeah. Okay, moving on to the, uh, to the communicable attributes of God. We've got quite a few to, to talk about. What does communicable mean? Shared. That's exactly right. So these are the qualities or characteristics that God shares with his people, right? Now, why would, he, why would we share some of these attributes? Yeah, we're created in his image, so it makes sense that we are going to, in some way, reflect some of the, characters of, some of the character of God, right? Um, that, and or again, when we say share, we don't mean that they're the exact same. They just mean they're, that they're of the same kind, right? So it's, it's, it's not that when, when I am loving, that my love is just like God's love, but that I'm reflecting in some pale comparison the, how God loves. Um, and so, um, in, fact, in fact, as we think about these things, I guess we can relate all this, uh, I feel like at some point I need to come back and teach on this some more, like the empathy issue. Uh, it's coming up a lot recently uh, in kind of broader church culture. And so, good night, this thing is. It's just kind of a red blur up there. Um, we'll use a different color. Okay. Um, so if you were thinking through communicable attributes, what are some of the attributes of God that we share with him, that are more specifically he shares with us? And I mean that 
he gives to us that we would reflect of him. Things that belong to him that we reflect in our own world. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Is that right? Thirteen. How many of those thirteen can you get? Someone's going to come up with one that I don't have, and then I'm going to feel really bad. Creative. Creative. I don't have that one. <laughs> and. The same way, because you can create out of nothing. Okay. Create out of what we've seen. Correct. I, still I'll put creative over here. It's not on my list, but I, we will talk about it. <laughs> Reason. Reason. Man, you're going <laughs> to. <laughs> okay. Forget this. You guys are smarter than me. We're going with my list, and that's... Uh... Um, the thing about it is, I think uh, most of the things we come up with are going to fall under the ones that I have, because uh, these are, uh, yeah, they're, gonna, they're going to overlap a little bit. And, cause, and some of them are going to be ones that you, don't, you wouldn't expect, because I'm going to say sovereign. And that throws you off already. You're like, oh, I don't like it. I don't like the fact that, like, I struggled for years with God being sovereign, and now you're talking about me being sovereign? Like, I, <laughs> like, I don't know if that's true. Um, there are a bunch of ways to do this. If you were to pick up Grudem, Grudem's systematic theology, he would give you a different list, but I think they will end up being a, a similar um, a similar list. Uh, there are so, several of them in here that I think, like I said, are going to throw you off. Because I'm going to say, what if I say the word holy? We're called to be holy. Yeah. Because some of these you go, that, but that's God. Well, that makes sense, right? Because God is the definition of these things. But it doesn't mean that we can't share in those qualities in some way. Um, I tried to write them in, in um, adjective form of some way. Sometimes participles, but. And someone's already like, that's a Sunday. We don't do grammar. <laughs> so, merciful, good. Again, I think the ones that would throw us, most of us off are glorious, righteous, holy, and sovereign. Those ones I think are hesitant, but that's one of the reasons why I think they're in there. Um, let's deal first with, uh, with Randy's creative. Are we, as human beings, creative? Not as creative as we think, but y yes, right? What do we mean that we, when we say we create something? Because now I'm going to erase it. We're talking about it, so. It? All right, I'll put it back here. Build. We design it. We build things. Yeah, think of yeah we think of things. It's that we enjoy what we create. We enjoy. Yeah. So in a very real sense, this is a this is a, I don't mind adding this in as an as a shared attribute, um, because it is something that we share with God. I think that's where it's going to go. I think, that, I think you're right. Because you're taking what's been given to you and, and using it. Your Correct. I think that's exactly right. I think it goes under sovereign. Um, but it is interesting. I don't mind putting it off to the side to make sure that we cover it somewhere else. But it, I, think, I think it would fit somewhere else, probably under sovereign. Right? Because um, why, why would I say that? Because, and I think this is why Lacey's saying it as well, is how is God as creator described? And you think of the imagery as potter, pottery, potter clay. Well, that's an, also an imagery of sovereignty, right? Um, and so creation is about, again, when God creates, what he's doing is marking out the space in which everything inside of it belongs to him. And you go, well, that's weird because he creates everything. Well, he marked off the space which belongs to him, and that's everything. Uh, that's, that's how that works. God created out of nothing, right? Remember, we, we, what's the phrase we used? Ex nihilo. Um, 
out of nothing God created, which means he spoke everything into existence, which is why things like uh, the Big Bang Theory or other things don't actually get to the heart of what we're trying to figure out. Right? Because the heart is, where does this, like, we're not asking, well, stuff bumps together and explodes and then we have the universe. Well, the question we're asking is, where does the stuff come from? Like, not where, when we ask what the universe, where the universe came from, if, if that's the question we're asking, um, we're, not, we're not asking where did what we see come from. We're asking specifically, where did it all start? And like, things like the Big Bang Theory don't actually answer that question because they don't give you the answer as to where the stuff came from that bumped together in the first place to cause the explosion that gets there. And what, when we say that God is creator, he creates out of nothing. Is that how we create? We create out of mediums. We create out of things that is given, given to us. So, and so um, whether it be stone for a, um, for a uh, sculptor, whether it be clay for a modeler, whether it be paints for a painter, um, we use things to create things. And actually what we create isn't anything new. It's just a reflection of what God's already created. And so in all those ways, we're, our, our creativity is not as creative as we think it is. Does that make sense? Like, I don't want to, I'm like, put, not putting down the arts, I'm all about the arts. Um, but our creativity is not often as creative as we think it is. We think, like, I've done this, you know. I mean, how do, how do I know that's true? Um, the movies that we create now are just rip-offs of things that have already done. They're like, oh, we haven't, every, I mean, almost everything that we do now is just taken from somewhere else of, of, of creation. Like, of things we've already done. So it's like, we, ha we can't come with a new movie. We're like, well, they made a great movie back in the, in the day, so we're going to do Ocean's Eleven again. Like yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Ed, Ed, Lynn, Ed, well played, well played. That's on videotape. In, ca in case the SBC police are listening, that's Matt Steele. Matt, you want to give, give a wave to the camera? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, Ed Litton sermons stolen from somewhere else, right? Yeah, like, yeah. And if I'm Ed Litton and I'm going to steal a sermon, I'd steal some sermons better than J.D. Greer's. But, oh, the, did I go there? Like, oh, man. Like, okay, that's... Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so the, the good things God gives us, we typically misuse and misorder, right? And so God gives us, God gives us good gifts and we can't even do, we don't even use those things well. So God gives us, whether it's the gift of a creative mind or whether it's like actual gifts. So like God gives us marriage as a gift and we screw that up. Right? God gives us sex as a gift and we screw that up. Like God, everything that God gives us as a gift, we typically distort um, so which is why our art is usually not that good. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, like, things like tangelos. What, who, whose crazy idea was it to make, to breed an orange and a tangerine together into tangelo? They're fantastic, actually. <laughs> I say that. That's just the first thing I could think of, like, a hybrid thing, but, like, I love those. We had a tangelo tree growing up. In between our orange tree and our tangerine tree, we had a tangelo tree, and I loved it. Tangelos are way better than tangerines, which I think are gross. Um, but, yeah, so, yeah, so we, we, we tend to kind of um, um, warp. There's a word I'm thinking of. I'm trying to think of a, a, a less offensive word. We, we tend to take God's good things and, and really distort and warp uh, those things. Um, and so, yeah, cre our, us as creatives, um, again, are not usually as creative as, as we think we are. I mean, most music is sampled now. Uh, most movies are just retreads. So even the arts are less arty than they used to be. Um, and so it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting reality. But, but yet we are not creative in the same way God is creative. God creates out of nothing things that never existed before. We create in a media in a medium, out of various media, we create in a medium something that's already existed, but just a, a version of it that we think is good. But not so much even what we're creating a product of it, but the fact that you have the desire to do it. And Correct. That that's the shared part. Yeah, yeah. But you just see how it, it, it's a good example of how uh, our communicable, the, I should I change that too, how our communicable attributes um, are are when we share them, we don't share them perfectly. We don't share them in the exact same way. 
and so it, it distorts how we how we share them. I don't think I have still black anymore. So this would be shared. Okay, moving on. Um, uh, I, I oh yeah. Mention. Sorry, forgot about you. Sure. And Peter says that everything comes from water. Okay. So the nothing is God and that river, and that's going to turn into stars and us and everything. Okay. I'm going to take your word for it. Well, you can look at it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first one on our list, and we're going to go through, I put these in order. I'm going to go through them, actually. So personal is the first one on our list. Um, the, the God that we've just talked about in our incommunicable attributes, the self-existent, immutable, unchangeable, omnipresent, omnipotent God is not an impersonal being out there in beyond the stars, but he is a personal being who relates to us by his choice. He chooses to relate to us. Um, and we are able to relate to one another. We are personal beings because we've been made in the image of God. And some of you may go, but some people are more personable than others. That's true. Um, there's extroverts and there's introverts. And we're, KD and I were talking about this last night. Like he, I, he, at some point last night, he's like, is this hard for you to do, like, just walk out to people? Yes. It is hard for me to walk out to people I don't know and just start a conversation with them. I feel super awkward all the time, uh, especially when it's like uh, I'm a 40-year-old man talking to like, teenage kids. I feel like a creep. Like just walking up, like, hey, kid, want to come over to our church? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, imagine if we were handing out candy, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, kid, here's some candy. Get in the van, you know? Like, that's super creepy. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but that's how I feel. Um, yeah, and so, you go, know, well, we don't all, we don't all um, want to relate in the same way. But listen, introverts thrive off of personal interaction. It's just the circle's smaller. The fact that, so no one gets out of this. No one can go, well, I'm not very personable, so I don't relate to God this way. No, we all do, introvert or extrovert, because we, we are reflecting the very, uh, the, the, the shared image of God, the image of God that he has made us in. We're reflecting that by the fact that we relate to people at all. We, we need human contact. It's one of the reasons why, um, it's one of the reasons why um, lockdowns, that sorts of things are, are bad. I mean, one of the reasons. Um, forget the whole freedom part, but um, if you forget the whole freedom part, which is, you shouldn't forget the freedom part, but if you put that aside for a second, the fact that, that it causes uh, a distance between people. I, I literally was in a conversation um, with a guy, another pastor, try, trying to explain why churches, why, why online church is not the same as being in person. And his whole, his whole thing is like, but like we have a, a Zoom group and we get together and it's the same thing. And I'm like, it's not the same thing. Like, um, it's, and he's like, well, what's missing from, what, what's missing from uh, being in a Zoom meeting and being in person in real life? I'm like, you, like you're missing. <laughs> like the, the, the missing is like, uh, it, you're not just an avatar on a screen. Like that's not, and we've been warped into thinking that, that, I'm getting off track here, but we've been warped into thinking, this is important, uh, we've been warped into thinking that virtual interaction is the same thing as real interaction. It's a cheap imitation of, per, of personal interaction. It's a cheap imitation. It cannot be, it cannot be fabricated, and, and so kind of like my, one of my, what I thought was a clinching point to him, but he was digging his heels in even further. Um, what I thought was a clinching point is, ask a family that's that is in the military where the husband is deployed if virtual conferencing is the same thing as being there in person and the answer is for military people who've been here the answer is absolutely not there's a reason why long distance people talk about long distance relationships being difficult why because you're not there and so the idea like oh well virtual church is the same thing as in-person church no it's not not at all and so um Correct. Because it's one, what one of them. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and people have also and to, and, to throw, and to kind of throw this out further. Um, yeah, you can't do communion exactly. It's one of the reasons when we came back after the whole COVID thing is we're like, 
this is, this is a good reason why we should be doing communion every single week. Because it actually, people should feel it when they're not there. Same thing with singing. Yeah, you guys had to deal with that in Germany. Same thing with singing. Like, it's not this, like, corporate worship is, but besides the fact that we've been commanded by God to do these things, like, which is the ultimate trump card, let's put that aside for a second, <laughs> that, that God has commanded us to meet together. And, and the Zoom, like, it's one thing if we go, hey, listen, a, a blizzard has come through here, and for this week we can't meet together, but we, we're going to try to do something through Zoom. Sure, as long as we all recognize that it's not the like we are, we are, we are, are providentially hindered from gathering together. Okay, we're providentially hindered from gathering together. As long as we recognize that gathering together is what we ought to be doing, and that us meeting via Zoom is not the equivalent. And I don't. And I think the problem is that people would go. I don't think it's not the equivalent. They think if if we just have the interaction, then it's or just kind of virtual interaction. It's the same. Um, people have asked. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and throw this out here and here. People have asked, why is it that we don't do live stream? This is why we don't do live stream. Is for this exact reason. And I know that makes it un like live stream would be a lot easier for everybody. I get that. But I think it like you, when we're out, we should feel the pain of being out. We should feel to go, this is not right. Like, I should be with my church family. And it creates a longing that is met by being with the church family. And, I mean, we all know that. When you listen to a sermon in the middle of the week, it's not the same thing. Like, you need to be able to see each other. And this is, how is it that, uh, this is why you can't pipe in music and it be the same thing, right? Like, we have to see each other and encourage how this is ephesians 4 of encouraging one another with psalms and spiritual songs you can't do that if you're not with each other and which is why you should be singing um in church right Yeah, yeah, right, which is why if someone, if someone does not desire to gather with the church, we go, how can we trust that you are a believer, right, because we're going like, one of the evidences of faith is that you long to be with God's people, and so, so people, uh, again, I'm, I'm hitting on some issues that we might deal with, have dealt with in the past like six years or so, but if someone says, well, wh why must you be a baptized believer and a member of a church to take of the Lord's Supper? Because otherwise, you're saying that church membership is of no value. Connection, like, you can't just be a, a Christian floating around in the ether, popping in over here, popping in over here. Like, you need to be connected to a people who can hold you accountable, who, who know who you are, who are discipling you, who are building you up, who you are under the authority of, and who, who, are, who are, like, in relationship with you. And if you're just floating in and floating out, then, then the Lord's Supper means nothing to you. It's just a, it's just a ritual at that point. The, the idea of communion is, is not a just me and God communing together. It's about us and God communing together. That's why we don't do communion at home. We gather together with the saints to do that, and we gather together with the saints that are our saints. And you go, well, what about people who are on vacation? Yeah, if you're, if you're a part of another church and you're visiting with us, man, that's why we invite you. If you're a member of another church, man, you're welcome to participate with us. But if you're not a member of another church, that's why we go, you need to be a, a baptized believer and a, and a member of good standing with another church. Because if you're not a member of another church, I'm not sure you're saved. Not, we all obviously know people are in process of membership. That we're going to count that as they're pursuing membership. That's one thing. But if you're just like, well, I'm happily not a member somewhere, I, I just don't trust that you're saved. And that sounds harsh, I, I know, but I, I think it lines up with how Scripture talks about the body. There's no like random pinkies like laying around. That's gross. <laughs> like you got to be connected to the body or you're just, that's just gross. <laughs> you got the body metaphor? Like some people are like, oh wait, it took you a second to get the body metaphor. Maybe I wasn't very clear on that. Like a pinky disconnected from the body is dead, Right? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm sorry. When you, read, when you read about the elders and the teachers in the church and their responsibility, 
how can they shepherd a flock if they don't know who their flock is? That's exactly right. You know, so it's your it's a burden on the the leaders of the church too because they're res, they're held responsible. Right. They have to know who they're responsible for. Right. Right, which is why membership is important in the first place. I mean, just for uh, passages on church discipline would make no sense if there weren't membership. Passages on elder authority and leadership would make no sense if there wasn't church membership. I mean, we come across people all the time. Like, there's some people I dearly love, um, even in our in our own city, who who would go, who would be kind of like anti church membership, and uh, and. Or, or kind of skeptical of church membership and they, they're like well I just don't see it in scripture and you can take them to all the passages and they're still like I don't see it in scripture because it doesn't say church membership um, and so you go well how can this be true if this isn't true how can this be true if this isn't true like it's a it's by deduction we kind of kind of piece all these things together and I, I think that there's a missing out if you like um so, you know, when we talk about communion, we talk about there's, there's various types of communion. So you have, um, th- throughout church history, th- there's been a broad practice of only people in our local church take of communion together. That's called closed communion, where it's only the members of the local body take communion together. Um, then they have what they call open communion, which is where a church would basically go, well, anyone who identifies as a Christian at all is welcome to do this. And so you'll see... Um, uh, a lot of churches will do that kind of thing where they'll kind of set up a table in the back and like, hey, yeah, at any point during the service, you feel the unction to get up and go do that. You go do that. And like, that's really weird to me. Um, in fact, here's you know something crazy. People like we bag on the SBC and Baptist Faith and Message sometimes. The Baptist Faith and Message, basically no church that practices open communion can be a member of, it, can be a member of the Southern West Convention. How about we draw that line somewhere? About half the churches will be gone, by the way. I've pointed that out several times. I've been told, like, shh, shh. <laughs> like, I, I'm just pointing out, like, I read this, and it's pretty clear. Um, no church. You can do closed communion, or we can do what we do, which we call close communion, which is the members of our local church and any church that would be of a like kind of faith and order sort of church. Right? So if you're a member of a gospel preaching, this is why we say if you're a member of a gospel preaching church then you're, and, you're, and you've been baptized, you're welcome to be to partake of communion with us. I, I know I've gotten off the, the rails a little bit here, but I, it hopefully it explains to you why we do what we do. So when we spend all that time in the beginning, we don't just go, here, take this bread and take this, this wine, and we, get, we spend all that time kind of talking about who should take it and who should not take it. This is why. Because there's a proper way and an improper way. If 1 Corinthians means anything, there's a proper way and an improper way. And evidently the stakes are pretty high because Paul's response is, the reason why some of you are dead is because you took of this in an unworthy manner. And it doesn't just mean, uh, it doesn't just mean that because you're sinners. Like, we're all sinners. There's something beyond that that's being done or, or not being done. And so, I think it's a pretty important issue. Um, how do we get there? Oh, that's right. We're talking about being personal. Being. <laughs> but no, but it's important, right? We're talk, as we talk about communion, that's what we're talking about. That is not something you can do virtually. It's not something we do outside the church. Like when your community group gets together or your Bible study gets together or when FCA gets together or, when, or you and your friends get together, you don't just go, here's some bread and wine. What, what prevents us from taking communion? You know, this is not, anyone get that reference in Acts? No, all right. Uh, here's some water. What prevents us from, uh, you don't just go, well, here's some, here's some crackers and some juice and so let's do communion together. No, it's a church ordinance that's celebrated when the church gathers. Which shows you that if you don't gather, like, it's one thing, like, if we are provincially hindered from gathering, we should not do the things that we would normally do when we gather. So you, if someone asks, well, why don't we do a live stream? That's one other thing. We shouldn't pretend like this is the church. Like, no, we are providentially prevented from gathering. And if you're on vacation or I'm on vacation or away, like, we should feel that pain of going, I'm not with my church family. Um, and so even if you're with another church, it's like, this is good, but it's not the same thing as being with my church family. Um, and so that creates a longing that, that for the next time you meet together, the next Lord's Day. Um, and so um, we can get into that God has, God has wired us also with a weekly longing for this. And that, that's not, ju- again, that's not just tradition that we meet once a week on the Lord's Day. It's hardwired into creation. That, that we meet on a weekly basis on the Lord's Day to gather together. And that when we miss it, we miss it. 
We should miss it. Does that make sense? Um, and so we should be longing to get together on those days. Um, okay, we've gone over time. We've hit one. <laughs> we'll see how far we get. Um, actually, next week is our fifth Sunday. So it's the last Sunday of the month. Yeah, so next week is our prayer meeting. Um, and KD will be doing the exposition next week? Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and so, we'll, so KD will be doing the exposition next week. We'll be doing prayer together. Um, again, once a month we gather together to, do, to pray together. And so uh, that's our time in this class next week. And once we get back into um, the first week in September, we'll jump back into this class and pick up right where we've left off here. Uh, let me pray for us, and then we can be There's dismissed. one more verse that I thought might be okay. needed. Okay. It says that the last Jesus will separate the sheep yeah. and the goats, and we'll say, but I did everything. Yeah. worked miracles. Yeah. Jesus Depart from me, I never knew you. Never, yeah. Personally, they never knew it. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, there is a, yeah, and we will pick up here and kind of segue from here into the next one when we get back um, in a couple weeks. But that's, that's a good point. That's exactly right. All right, let me pray for us. I feel like God, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, the truth of who you are. Thank you for revealing this truth to us that we may understand you. Not that we may, we, we, can, we know we can never wrap our minds around who you are. But Lord, we want to worship you. We want to love you. We want to follow you. And so, Lord, I thank you for revealing yourself to us. Thank you for creating us in your image that we might share um, and, and reflect some of your attributes. And, Lord, we pray that you will help us to, to do this well, that we take your gifts that you've given us and we use them well. Um, help us with this. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.